Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. Today's message is entitled, The Year of the Triple Blessing. Once every seven Sabbath of years, that is, every 49 years, the Israelites were to proclaim and consecrate the 50th year. The 50th year was called the Year of Jubilee. When was the year of Jubilee proclaimed? Good question. It was proclaimed on the Day of Atonement. You would think that if it's the year of Jubilee, that it would begin on the first day of the first month of the new year. But instead, it was proclaimed on the 10th day of the seventh month. That is the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement, the Jewish Day of Atonement was celebrated two weeks ago on Monday, September the 25th, 2023. It was celebrated on the 10th day of the seventh month of the Jewish year. The year of Jubilee was a time of celebrating. It was a time of rejoicing. Their sins and their iniquities were all attuned for. They were all rolled ahead one more year. They got their land back. They got their property back. Their, their enslaved loved ones were all set free. And if they themselves were enslaved for any reason, they too would be set free. It doesn't matter the reason. Everything was festive and there was great rejoicing at the, at the year of Jubilee. Even financial transactions were based on, or at the very least, took into consideration the year of Jubilee. Turn with me please to Leviticus chapter 25 verse 13 through 22. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the Jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price. And if the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of the crops that he is selling you. You must not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and then you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, if we may not sow or gather in our crops? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crops arrive. In the year of Jubilee, each person was allowed to return to their own original property. And if they had sold it, the deed would return to them, the original owner. Likewise, if they had sold themselves or if they had sold their children into slavery for whatever reason, maybe they, they had debt and couldn't pay the debt and they had to sell their children into slavery to cover that debt, those children would be released and allowed to go back home at the time of Jubilee. In other words, the year of Jubilee was the year of proclamation of freedom and the return of each one to their original inheritance. It was the original emancipation proclamation, but only thing on steroids. The year of Jubilee was celebrated every 50 years, but here's what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry, found in Luke chapter four, verse 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on a Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue was fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I want you to notice all the things that the prophet Isaiah was prophesying. He was prophesying proclamation of the good news of the gospel. Salvation has come, Jesus said. Salvation is here. Isaiah also proclaimed the proclamation of freedom to the enslaved. Jesus said, liberty has now come. You are now free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Isaiah proclaimed healing. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus paid not only for our salvation, but for our healing. By his stripes you are healed. Proclamation of freedom from mental and psychological problems like depression, fear, anxiety, panic attacks, and the likes. They're all under the blood of Jesus. They are gone in Jesus' name. In other words, Jesus said he came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord or the year, the favorable time of the Lord. That word translated year, it means an era. It means an epoch an undefined period of time. It's indefinite. What is the epoch of the Lord's favor that Jesus said that he was anointed to proclaim? It was the year of Jubilee that would find its fulfillment in the thousand year reign. We're living in that time period that is considered the 49th year, the year of the proclamation of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee is extremely important to us because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all lost our way. Please understand that once we were lost, but now we are found. We were blind, but now we see. Once we had sold ourselves to do evil, and we became slaves to sin with no way of ransoming ourselves. But Jesus, the anointed one, the promised Messiah, was sent with the good news of proclamation. He came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee. We are living in that 49th year of Yom Kippur. Understand that the number 50, five zero, is the number of the age of the church. Jubilee was celebrated in the 50th year, the year of freedom. Since every seventh year was a Sabbath year, the Israelites were to count seven Sabbath years, which would be seven times seven, which is equal to 49 years. Then the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost was celebrated on the 50th day, starting the first day of the week after Passover, that they were to count seven Sabbaths, which is equal to 49 days. And the next day, the 50th day, was the day of Pentecost. I want to show you something, a mystery that the Lord God hid in the days of creation and confirmed it in the different feasts and in the different celebrations that the Jews observed. Here is what I mean. One, God created everything in six days and on the seventh day, he rested. The law commanded that the Israelites keep the seventh day and to keep it holy. They were not to do any work on this day. Number two, the Israelites were instructed to sow and reap the land for six years. But on the seventh year or in the seventh year, there was to be no sowing, no reaping. The land was to enjoy its Sabbath year rest. It was the rest for the land. The law commanded that no sowing or reaping would be done in that seventh year. Number three, there will be 6,000 years of regular living for mankind. 
then there will be 1,000 years of rest called the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus will return and he will reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Now, I want you to watch this. In regard to the coming of the Lord, Peter explained in his second epistle that one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day with the Lord. Second Peter chapter three, verse eight. And then Moses, he alludes to the same exact thing in Psalms 90 verse four. And now, if we use that cipher, we understand that God created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them in six literal days, and then the Sabbath, the day of rest. Likewise, all work was to be done in six days, and the seventh day was a day of rest, which was a pattern for the yearly Sabbath. Six years the Israelites were to sow, six years they were to reap, but in the seventh year there was no sowing and no reaping, a Sabbath year's rest for the land, which was a pattern for the existence of mankind this side of eternity. Let me explain. Each day of creation represents a thousand years of existence for mankind. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day with the Lord. Six days represent six thousand years. The earth is not millions or billions of years old, as the atheistic scientists would have you believe. I understand that some listening to this message will strongly disagree with me because, obviously, science can never be wrong, and our government will never lie to us. But be that as it may, there is no plausible scientific proof to suggest that mankind evolved over millions or billions of years. If there was scientific proof, they would have presented it years ago and silenced the church. But up to now, it is only a made up theory taught as facts. History is only a few thousand years old because the earth is only a few thousand years old. Therefore, I choose to believe the one who created everything and his word advocates a young earth, as young as 6,000 years old. Because again, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. 6,000 years of human existence and then the 1,000 year reign of Christ better known as the millennial reign of Christ. The Bible is full of symbols, it's full of typologies and prototypes and shadows of things to come. And creation is just another typology of time. Just to confirm what I'm saying. According to biblical calculation, going back from the time of Adam and counting the years each one lived, and each one died, and lining that up with historical dates that we know of, we have unequivocally a total of 6,000 years. In other words, according to the creation plan, we are in the sixth year. According to the sabbatical year, we're in the sixth year. And according to Jubilee, we are in the 49th year. What happens in all three? We have a Sabbath, a day of rest. I want us to read a fairly long portion of scripture, but I think it's crucial, it's critical to hear so that we can fully understand what it is that I am saying. Turn with me please to Hebrews chapter three, verse seven through 11, then we're gonna skip down to verse 15 and we're gonna read all the way through to chapter 4, verse 11. So starting in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test 
and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is speaking of the Israelites that Moses and Aaron brought up out of the land of Egypt. The writer goes on to encourage his readers to be careful not to foster an unbelieving heart like they did and be led astray. Now we're gonna skip down to verse 15. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now, I want you to pay really close attention to what the writer says next. Start in chapter four, verse one. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Did you notice that? The promise of entering his rest still stands. In other words, there is a promised Sabbath still outstanding. It is still to be fulfilled. Remember, a Sabbath is not a forever thing, but a temporary thing. It's either one day, one year or 1,000 years, but it is not eternity. How do I know? Because in eternity, we're returning to our original origins, the Garden of Eden equivalent. Adam was created to work the land, not to vacation in the land. But in a thousand year Sabbath rest, we will rest from all of our works. It is given to us by our God to rest for that thousand years, to reign and to rule with him. Yes, we will return to our original uncorrupted innocence. We'll be so innocent that we will ask Jesus about his scars. And this is what, what it says, Zechariah chapter 13, verse six. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. We will be innocent just like Adam and Eve were innocent in the Garden of Eden. We will return to our original state. Now, listen closely to the wording of the next few verses. Verse three. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The writer's whole discourse is interpreting Psalms 95, verse seven through 11. Then he likens the coming Sabbath rest to the seventh day weekly rest found in Genesis chapter two, verse one through three. Why? Because the seventh day weekly Sabbath was a prototype or a model of the millennial reign of Christ. The weekly Sabbath foreshadowed the thousand year Sabbath. Again, I want you to listen closely to the next few verses. 
The writer explicitly expounds his argument so that there will be no doubt or misunderstanding that he's talking about a future day of rest and not one given by Joshua during the time of the conquest of Canaan. Verse 8. If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. How is that possible, Brother Kenny? Well, good question. Revelation 20, verse 1 through 6 says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shed it and seal it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. We can't have a real Sabbath day's rest with Satan running loose in the world. And God knew that. Therefore, God bound that old devil, threw him in a pit for a whole Sabbath day's rest. Namely, the one thousand year rest. Verse 4. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for how long? A thousand years. Only the righteous were resurrected to reign and to rule with Jesus for a thousand years. That's the millennial reign of Christ. The rest of the dead, those wicked people, those who have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, they remain dead until the time of the judgment. So now that we have established that we are living in those days, which days, Brother Kenny? The days just before the millennial reign of Christ which is the promised Sabbath day's rest. That is the days that we are living in. Therefore, if we are living in the days just before the promised Sabbath day's rest, that would mean that we are in the sixth year, the year of the triple blessing. I want us to revisit our scripture and reread that text just to remind ourselves what God said about the sixth year. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 21. I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for how long? Sufficient for three years. God said that in the sixth year, and that's the year that we are now in, he said that he will command his blessing so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. In other words, it is a triple blessing. The Lord will cause you to prosper for it is his, his will, his blessing. He gives us the ability to gain wealth. It is him who gives us that power to gain wealth. The day is coming when everything will be taken away from us Christians. So we need to store up now during the year of the triple blessing. But here's the kicker. We are not given wealth to splurge it only on ourselves. We're not given wealth to be misers. It does us no good to have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. It does us no good to have millions or even hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank if we don't sow into the harvest of souls. Remember, we are blessed 
to be a blessing. And that we might have something in eternity because the only thing that we will have in eternity is what we send on ahead of us in this time. In other words, the triple blessing is the power of Almighty God. Paul said that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20. Therefore, for those who diligently seek the Lord at this time will receive the triple blessing in regards to power as well. This is our last hurrah. So let us not make it a last ditch effort that will end in failure. Let us pursue souls, for the fields are white unto harvest, but the workers are few. Let us use our finances and to, to influence good so that we can win souls. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 9. He said, and I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into where? eternal dwellings. Also, I want us to read Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is the year of the triple blessing. Now is the time to store up treasure in heaven. Treasure that will not fade. Treasure that will not lose value like the stock market does. Like, like, like our mon money does. A currency loses its wealth every year. It does not lose value, but it is waiting there for us when we get there in eternity. If you're going to create wealth, if you have been working an idea for a business, if you're planning on any type of investment, now is the time because the Sabbath will soon be here and the Sabbath no man can work. God has said he will command his blessing. He will command his triple blessing on you in the sixth year, just before the year of the Sabbath rest. But, but here's the thing. God only commands his blessing on his people. So the question is, are you one of his people? Have you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior? If you are not one of God's people. If you have not been bought by Jesus, you can be. If you want to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus, all you got to do is to ask. Do not wait until the door is closed because once that door is closed, it is too late. It's all over. So if you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you want to reign and to rule with Him in the thousand years Sabbath rest, Here's how you do it. Just ask him. Ask Jesus. And he will give you eternal life. And you will live forever. Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I have transgressed your commandments. I have broken your laws. I've lived a vile life apart from you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to wipe away my iniquities from before your eyes. I receive now your grace. I receive now your forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do, as usual, get a Bible. Take it off your shelf, go out and buy one, 
Do whatever you have to do. Get yourself a Bible, a physical Bible, and physically read that Bible. Get a highlighter. Highlight the verses. Learn those verses. Memorize those verses. Hide God's word away in your heart that you might not sin against them. Find yourself a Bible-believing church, one who still believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, one who still believes there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live, one who still believes that Jesus is coming back to get us real soon. He's coming back for a spotless church, and we have to be ready. Don't join one of those churches that believes any way is okay. Whatever you want to do, do it, because God wants you happy. That is not reality. The reality is we have to die to self. We have to be washed in the blood of Jesus. And join that church. Join a church like that. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that is what we're all striving for. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold of Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.